wholesale bundles on Amazon, how to step up your FBA business and profit margins by bundling popular products together. What's up? What's up, Nick Loper here. Welcome to the Side Hustle Show because your business should make someone else's life better or easier. That's why they're doing business with you. And that's exactly what Amy Fearman and Kristen Ostrander are doing with their Amazon FBA business. They've both been selling online for over 10 years, but recently have focused on the specific strategy of wholesale bundles. That is packaging two or more complementary products together. Think shampoo and conditioner, peanut butter and jelly, and selling those under one listing. Those bundles make life easier for the one-click ordering, free prime shipping Amazon customer, and they make life better for you as the seller because you face less competition and can earn better profit margins. Together, Amy and Kristen, the self-described bundle queens, run mommyincome.com, where they share more about their business and how they've generated over $2 million in sales in the last 12 months. But stick around today to hear their bundle product research process, your inventory sourcing options, and what kinds of upfront investment price points and margins are realistic. Notes and links for this one, plus the free PDF highlight reel with all of Amy and Kristen's top tips are at sidehustlenation.com slash bundle. I'll be back with my top takeaways from this chat with Amy and Kristen after the interview. You'll hear Amy first, and then Kristen is going to chime in. Ready? Let's do it. Speed and convenience and variety is what your Amazon buyer is looking for. And by bundling, you are able to provide those things for them. Maybe, Kristen, tell me about your first bundle sale, like when the light bulb went off, they're like, okay, this is going to be a thing. So one of the the first bundles that I created was a variety pack of granola bars. So we're selling grocery items and I always buy, you know, I have a, a family of five. And so we always buy from places like Costco. And in Costco, there was always these flavors of granola bars that like one of them we didn't want. And there'd be like 10 in a box. And it's like, what do we do with these extra 10? And so I started looking on Amazon thinking, gosh, if we don't like these, I wonder if other someone else does. And what what would be a better bundle combination? Because I don't want these granola bars. So I, I started looking on Amazon and realizing that there were some variety packs out there with different flavors in them. And I thought, well, I could throw these in with another flavor that I could purchase from separately and then put another combo together that's lemon, but then there's also other fruit flavors versus chocolate and peanut butter flavors. So put that together as well. And and it sold pretty well to just get rid of something I already had in my house and was always thinking selling. And so that was one bundle. The other one was a retail arbitrage bundle where we were combining carrying cases with small Shopkins toys back when they were really popular. We would put a couple of the Shopkins toys together plus a little carrying case because it just didn't make enough money selling things by themselves. So it made us more money to add something of value to the set and then sell it as a whole. And to speak to Kristen's point there about providing the value for us, it's a value to the customer because it will use the Shopkins example. The kids have a way to carry these small toys around. So that's a value to the the mom not having to step on small Shopkins everywhere. But it's also a value to you as a seller. When you're selling on Amazon, you're selling a $10 item or a $30 item. Oftentimes your fees, your percentage of fees taken out of the lower ticket item is substantially more than out of a higher ticket item. And when you're creating bundles, you're able to charge a higher price. So the percentage of fees that gets taken out of that is much less. Okay, that makes sense because a lot of the fees are going to be just flat fees. Like, hey, we're going to charge you two bucks to pick it off the shelf or whatever. Correct. Are you allowed to, I mean, obviously you were, but are you allowed to just like roll up to Costco and be like, yeah, I don't like this, this part of the variety pack. Let me just send them in to Amazon. Like, what was the process like? I mean, I did that all the time when I used to do variety packs of different granola bars, being able to take, say I had five different varieties and took one of each out of those boxes and put them together and sell that set of here's a variety. You don't know what one you like of this new particular granola bar that's out there. Here's a variety pack that allows you to figure out what one you like so you can go buy that one. Okay. Yeah. The one that we were kicking around, my wife and I, when I told her we were recording this episode, she was like, oh, we should do, and maybe she'll get mad at me for sharing her business idea. (laughs) She was like, we should do like a sampler pack of all the baby bottles. Cause she's like, you never know which one your kid is going to like. And so before you commit to buying the 18 pack of Dr. Brown's or whoever, oh, you know, what if you could just get the one? Maybe somebody else is already doing that. 
That's a good idea. You know, it's it's a it's an idea where it is one of those try almost like try before you buy and it's just vetting the marketplace. So if you thought something like that was a good idea, you can look it up in the various tools that are available to you to check that out. Because like you said, if it's a problem for you, you're not the only one. You're not the only one on earth that's struggling with that same thing. Or I wasn't the only one on earth that bought the Costco variety pack and one out of the four flavors that we didn't like, but some other family does like that flavor. So there's no business idea like that that's too small or too niche when it comes to considering bundles because nine out of 10 times your wife is not the only one that thought of that. And maybe there isn't anything out there. So it would it's definitely an opportunity to look in and check the data and see see what else is available and what's out there to compare to. It's actually interesting because it does exist. And when you type in baby bottle, one of the first keywords that pops up is variety pack. Oh, in the auto suggest? In the auto suggest, it pops up. There are 4,200 searches a month for baby bottle variety pack, according to Merchant Words. So that to me says that there are people out there with the same idea that you have saying, I don't want to buy all of these things I'd like to have. And this, the one, the particular bundle I see on Amazon specifically calls for breastfed babies. And so it's specifically targeting a niche of babies that were breastfed. All right. What's the sales rank? Let's dive into this. Stuff. <laughs> 84,000 in baby, which is not amazing, but it's not horrible either. All right. It's, it's moving some units, but maybe it's not turning over super fast. Speaking of sales rank, the beauty about wholesale bundles, though, is that you're not directly competing on not only sales rank, but it's not necessarily a volume game. A lot of people on Amazon tend to play the volume game where they feel like if I can push five to 10,000 units a month and make sense on the dollar that I'm doing okay, and they're pushing a lot of product to where we carefully craft our wholesale bundles in a way that we're making 10 to $15 or more per bundle so that we don't have to sell as many units to make just as much profit as someone else is doing that's selling pennies on the dollar to just try to move volume. So we play a more long-term, larger margin game rather than a volume game. I like larger margin, so let's do it. Let's dive into the uh, research process here. If somebody's getting started and they're saying, okay, this sounds compelling, where do we start? place we always encourage people to start, and, and this goes for starting on Amazon, but it also goes for starting with wholesale bundles, is really understanding what you already know. We, we don't encourage somebody to sell in the toys, creating bundles in toys, if they have no experience with children, for example. So being able to tap into your own knowledge bank of what you already know, and we encourage people to, to write down ideas that they have. I'm an avid rock climber, right? So I know all about the tools and equipment that you need to be able to do the various different types of rock climbing. So being able to create maybe say a beginner's bundle for rock climbing with the shoes and the harness and the chalk bag and whatnot that you would need to do that. Being able to tap into something that you already know is an easier way to start in something like bundles than trying to do it in something that you know nothing about. That makes sense versus like, oh, the data pointed me here. So this is what I'm going to create. It's like, okay, starting at least for that first bundle, with a niche you're a little bit familiar with. Yeah, that's correct. And I think the reason why you know we've learned to start there is because everybody has the same data available to them. And if it's just a data mining game and you're constantly looking at just what the numbers are and top sellers or best sellers or what the software or that software tells you is a good buy, you and a thousand of your closest Amazon seller friends have access to the same information. To where if you're drawing from your own experience and your own knowledge bank, for example, what your, your wife said about the baby bottle variety pack, that was clearly an issue she was facing. And so she's drawing from her own knowledge bank to put that out into the world to say, this might be a problem or a niche or something for someone else. That's not exactly data driven. You can back up your idea and validate your idea with the data that's available through Merchant Words and Amazon and other things like Jungle Scout. But initially, the ideas come from what you're knowledgeable about. And that's what's different and set apart from how everyone else is doing things. Got it. So as you're going down this rabbit hole, are you just typing in keywords like this baby bottle variety pack just to see what else is already out there? Or would that be discouraging to say, okay, that bundle already exists onto the next idea? Give me an idea of, of what that process might look like. So before you jump onto Amazon, we actually have you jump into Merchant Words to look at the search volume for your idea. And typing in baby bottle variety, 
allows you to see, is there search volume? Is You're validating the idea because you can type in something and go, well, there's 100 people searching for that a month. That's not really worth looking into. But if there's 3,000 to 6,000 people, there is a niche of people there that are looking to buy an item similar to this. So there's a demand in the market. So you're looking to validate that idea that you've come up with, that you've brainstormed, and then taking it the next step and looking at it on Amazon to see what is out there. And that's one of the things I love about Merchant Words is you can actually click on, be looking at a keyword phrase and click on see what's on the first page of search results for that and see all the ASINs right within Merchant Words without having to go between Merchant Words and Amazon itself. It looks like Merchant Words is a a paid tool looks like around 30 bucks a month. Correct. Do you have any free alternatives for people starting out? If you're starting out, the, one of the best ways to look at keywords is actually with Amazon itself. When you type into the URL, all of those terms that pop up are Amazon's top terms for that particular search. So using that is a great way to collect keywords when you're just getting started. Another couple of ways to mine for keywords in, in a free way, which is not really foolproof. And that's why we recommend Merchant Words only because it's directly related to Amazon. But if you're just starting out and you're on a budget, looking at Google Trends is another good place to see what other people are typing in and, and searching for. And other places, other platforms, looking at Etsy, looking at eBay, looking at Pinterest in particular, to see what other products and ideas are out there related to the idea that you're trying to vet. And then again, which keywords other sources are using to communicate those. The nice thing about Merchant Words is it allows you to see what the search volume is, but you can go collect keywords from Pinterest. I've done that in, in my niche and found a lot of keywords that I wouldn't necessarily have thought about, but the buying public is referring it to this way. The, the one example we always share is handbags. The bag that women carry with them, what do you call it? And it's a bag, it's a, hand, it's a handbag, it's a purse, it's a tote. It's so many different things to different people. And if you are, you're missing out on a section of a demographic, if you aren't in some way referring to that item with one of those different words. Okay. I feel like a friend of mine used to wear this shirt. He had an SEO agency. And so it's like, <laughs> well, I forget what it was. An SEO guy walks into a bar, nightclub pub, <laughs> restaurant. It's like trying to use all these different keywords. Exactly. That's exactly the concept. So I found something just in Google right now, Celix, S-E-L-L-I-C-S.com. Looks like it has a 14-day free trial for a keyword research tool that's specific to Amazon. So if you want to get a two-week crash course in different search volumes, you might be able to dive in there and see what is going on. And to your point about the Amazon auto suggest, so you're saying as you type in these keywords and you hit the space bar and see what else pops up, they are sorting those by kind of this predictive likelihood of what you're going to type in next. So probably sorted by what they think has the most volume. Correct. Remember, Amazon itself is not a, it's a retailer, but it's mainly a data collection company. So they know what the top searches are and they're using the data that they've collected to give the best guess. They're trying to make the buyer's life easier. They don't want the buyer to have to type in the full string of words that are what they are looking for. If they can make it easier, the buyer gets to the click to buy button sooner than if they are having to type it all in. Got it. I've noticed that in the Google URLs, like, because it'll predict what I'm trying to type into. And then in the URL string, it'll be like, oh, they made it this far. They typed these three letters and then we, we were able to tell them where he wanted to go. Okay. So typing in these words, seeing what is already showing up in the Amazon search results, any red flags or proverbial green lights that you're looking for there? It's a basic supply and demand. So when you're looking for different things, specifically when you're looking at keyword numbers, how many other competitors are there? How many other bundle ideas are either already on the marketplace or are non-existent? So if you're looking for a bundle opportunity and you type in the baby bottle variety pack we've been talking about, and you see maybe one or two others, but it's not exactly the idea you had in mind. The good news is, is that if the search volume is there, which is why we use Merchant Word to kind of vet that, is that there's room for variety. Not two people want the same thing all the time. And so you have to look at the supply and demand. If you've got 5,000 searches a month for a particular bundle or variety pack or combination, and you only have three products out there that meet that demand, your chances of 
selling through another product is very, very high to where if you're doing a search and it's 5,000 searches a month and you search on Amazon and you come up with 150 different variety packs of, of the same type, it's another, it's not necessarily a red flag, but you have to look at where am I going to stand in the marketplace coming in when there's already 150 products to choose from? Is my variety pack going to stand out enough to get me a percentage, a piece of the pie, if you will, of those 5,000 searches a month if it doesn't stand out in some way? So is there room for variety even if someone else has the bundle? Absolutely. But there definitely comes a point or a threshold where you think, what percentage of the pie am I going to get bringing this new bundle to the marketplace unless it has some key feature that none of them have? And that's the beauty of bundles is that you can make a bundle similar to someone else's. But if you have a couple of key products in there that no one else can get anywhere else, maybe it's your own custom made product, a custom item you're, you're private labeling somehow as part of your bundle it, it sweetens the deal for you a bit because uh, you're not you're not comparing apples to apples at that point. You're comparing apples to oranges because your product is is bringing something different to the table as you're offering a similar product. Okay, so there's a couple of different ways to go about it. One way is to just replicate what's already out there. Hey, I'm going to carve out a, a piece of this pie just by saying, hey, there's proven demand here. And the second option being like, okay, this one's already selling. How can I make that different? How can I make that better? Exactly. Is there a minimum search volume that is interesting to you at the $2 million in sales level or maybe was interesting to you earlier on? We actually go a little bit differently than most people. We're not looking at your 50,000 and up search volume for keywords. We have a sweet spot between the three and the 6,000 range for keywords. And the reason that is, is, is we're looking for niche markets. We're not trying to sell the top 100 products on Amazon we're trying to find where there is demand that isn't being met. And by going to those smaller niches, there may be one or two people selling those. But if you have 4,200 search volume for a particular keyword phrase, that means that's being searched 4,200 times a month. And there's only two other bundles out there for that particular keyword phrase. Your opportunity for being able to sell one, 200, whatever you want to sell of that is an opportunity there. We're also of the mindset of you don't need to sell a whole lot of a few SKUs. We sell a few of a lot of SKUs and a few is is relative, right? I like to say for my personal store, I do 30 or up a month in sales for a particular bundle once it's been vetted and, and been selling for a while. Okay, gotcha. So three to 6,000 searches per month is the sweet spot and assuming the the level of competition isn't great. You gave the example of, okay, there's only three products, fantastic. If there's 150, maybe less fantastic. If those three products have 8,000 reviews, does that shy you away? Or do you say, maybe, maybe I could still make a tweak on this? I don't think it's as important as reviews as it is what what's the difference that you're bringing to the table. So if you talk about selling a, a granola bar variety pack and you see four or five other products out there that would meet that demand, yet you're bringing something different to the table. Maybe it's a different brand or a different flavor that no one else has. Maybe you're bringing in gluten-free and they have something else. So although it falls under the keywords of granola bar variety pack, what is going to set yours apart from someone else's? Is it a different flavor? Is it a different style? Is it a different size? Does it have a longer shelf life? Is it made out of organic ingredients? Whatever the case may be, you don't want to bring another bundle to the table unless it brings something new to the table. The more competition there is, the more you have to bring something different. Even within the granola bar space, you'll want to bring something a little bit different to the table because that will, again, attract different buyers. Not everyone wants just the four or five products that are out there or even the 150 that are out there. That's a little bit more to compete with. You want to try to be on the first few pages of your search. But bringing something different, a variety, a value add item, maybe instead of selling a five pack, you're selling a 25 pack, you know, whatever it is that's different, it can still fall under the same keywords, but you want to bring something different or new to the table that no one else is, is currently doing. Do you like the idea of selling consumables where people could either like subscribe and save to it, or they're going to keep coming back to this? Like, hey, my granola bars ran out. My kids went through them all. Now I'm, I'm going back to that same listing. I absolutely love selling consumables. When I started in bundles, it was very much in grocery. 
and coming back, buying the same thing over and over again. And that can go over any kind of disposable or consumable item. It allows you to have people coming back for that same thing. You're also always going to have a market because it's something that can be used up. People are going to always be needing it, right? So it makes sense. You have a replenishable item by the, just the nature of what you're offering because it's disposable or consumable. Tell me about sourcing that inventory. Is it's like if I'm a brand new seller, it seems a little bit intimidating to like all of a sudden say, okay, now I'm a, now I'm a wholesaler and now I have to go figure out how to. I've gone through this research process. I figured out I think there's some demand here. I think I could compete in this market. I think I could add value in this market. Now, how do I go about getting this stuff? So we suggest either attending or stalking a trade show. We have a free video on our website, mommyincome.com slash 100, the number 100. And it teaches you how to find a thousand wholesalers by noon today. And it's basically registering for a wholesale trade show and then looking at their exhibitor list and reaching out to the vendors that sell the products that you're looking for. And so finding those events, those trade shows, and you don't necessarily have to physically attend the show to be able to get the list that you need to start reaching out to legitimate wholesalers. A lot of people start with Google. And unfortunately, that leads to a lot of middlemen. And so you want to go a little bit more of a legitimate route by searching in the trade shows where people are showing up to sell their products wholesale. And then reaching out and and asking for a price lists and catalogs and they'll mail them to you. And that's a, it's a really good place to start. A lot of people are intimidated by starting wholesale because they have, feel like they have to have really deep pockets. To, and to be honest, it's really inexpensive a lot of times to start wholesale than people think. We're even speaking of a couple hundred dollars as opening orders for some of the companies that we personally deal with and going to a lot of trade shows ourselves. We've seen this over and over again about people being a lot more friendly about selling to Amazon sellers and having lower minimum orders for online individuals. So it's just learning and getting comfortable with the new process, but you don't have to have thousands of dollars or tons of experience to be able to start sourcing from legitimate wholesale companies. And I also wanted to bring up the point, another fear that people have is that fear of having the conversation with your potential vendor. Number one, it's okay to be a newbie. It's okay to ask the questions that you don't know. If you don't know how to read the numbers on their price list, Ask me how I know. I had that experience in my own business when I started wholesale and not knowing how to do it. The vendors, the reps that you're talking to are there to help you buy product. They're there to sell product to you. And so if you have questions, ask them. We actually talk about this in our course where we talk about a whole list of questions to ask. The other part of that is people are always afraid of the questions that the vendor is going to ask of them and being able to have a script for if they ask you, where do you sell? What most people don't understand is when the wholesaler is asking you that question, it doesn't always have to do with do you have a brick and mortar or are you online? They oftentimes, if they're a larger company, want to know which is the correct rep to put you with. What state is your business located in so I can connect you with the vendor representative that is going to be dealing with your account? Oh, okay. You don't necessarily have to, well, here's my e-commerce store URL or here's, you know, here's my Amazon homepage or something. It just is more like, what, what region do you operate in? Where can I, who can I put you in touch with? Exactly. Some people automatically jump to, I'm an Amazon seller. They're automatically going to say no. That's what's going on in your head. You're going to struggle through that question because you automatically think they're talking about Amazon. And we never tell anyone to flat out lie that you, that you don't sell on Amazon. We encourage people to be honest with that because if you're not, it comes back and bites you in the long run. And we don't want to encourage that. We want you to be able to grow a long-term sustainable business with wholesale bundles. And part of that is developing relationships with the reps for the companies that you work with. That starts off from the beginning and as you work through. Because let me tell you, you can get more profit into your product because you can get discounts or find out about products before or when they're on discount by having those conversations and those open and honest relationships with your reps. Are the brands anti-Amazon in that way? It seems like I'm selling you the product and unless it's like a really, really high-end brand that's concerned about, you know, the outlets they appear in, it seems like, hey, we're going to make our sale. Like you do what you want with the inventory. You could eat it yourself for all we care. Some companies are like that and some are not. So there are some that have, they look at Amazon as this big evil operation and or they're working directly with Amazon already. And so 
you can't necessarily compete with price. But there are other brands that are restricting their brands to third-party sellers because they're trying to protect the integrity of their brand or they're a highly counterfeitable item. So Nike is very restrictive on some of their really high-end shoes because they're highly counterfeitable in most Chinese counterfeit systems that they have. And so they don't want that to be showing up on Amazon. And so they use specific guidelines and restrictions on their brand to not be able to sell specific SKUs or specific ASINs on Amazon or higher end brands, you know, like Coach or Burberry or places that are trying to protect their brand mostly from counterfeit items. There are also some brands will say yes, but then they require you to adhere to their map pricing. So they're minimum advertised price. They don't want people coming in and then selling their high-end goods at lower prices. So it's it's definitely a brand protection that some brands put into place. Yeah, that makes sense. And I do like this kind of virtual wholesale trade show idea where they say, yeah, you don't even need to go, but if you register, you may be able to find the vendor list and reach out to people through there. Yeah. And it's actually a way that We do encourage trade show attendance only because it's nice to touch and feel product. And if for whatever reason you can't attend, you can ask for samples from your vendors. If you want to be sure about the quality of the product that you're providing and you've never experienced this particular product line that you're looking at, sometimes you can go to a store and get an idea of what the quality of a product is. Sometimes it's not something that's available in your area and you want to know what the quality you're going to sell. So you're not going to end up with negative feedback or whatnot because you're bringing a subpar product to the marketplace. Now, this is a little bit of a chicken or the egg challenge. So do you worry about getting your Amazon account ungated in whatever category you're looking at, if that's going to be an issue before you make that potentially several hundred dollar order with this with this wholesale supplier? Or does that come afterwards? Because you maybe you need that purchase order to show Amazon, hey, look, I'm a wholesaler. It depends. If you're gated in a category, Amazon will often ask you for wholesale invoices in order to ungate you or unrestrict you from that category. So unfortunately, it is a chicken and the egg kind of thing because you kind of need to invest, for example, in grocery. They expect you to purchase from a wholesale source an amount that's more than a personal consumption. So the general consensus is maybe like 20 to 30 units of one particular item and not necessarily a case of an item because they consider that as one, but instead buying at least 20 units of a single item and then showing that to Amazon to say, I am buying from legitimate wholesale sources. Here's my invoice. So sometimes you do have to make that upfront investment in order to get ungated because Amazon is asking you for invoices. So yes, that can definitely be what would someone would consider a risk factor. But the beauty of it is it's a small amount to pay upfront in order to ungate in a specific category that's pretty much a lifetime of ungating. So especially in grocery or health and beauty or specific categories like that, that they have a lot of consumables or what we consider a replenishable items. Things people use over and over again or that are consumable are very lucrative to sell because, again, they run out and you can replenish them over and over. So you're not constantly hunting for new products all the time because you've the trend has run out or something like that. It's, it's a consumable product. So it's worth the upfront risk to get those invoices and buy some product upfront so that you can get ungated because it opens a world of opportunity for you once you get ungated. And there is also the opportunity. There are plenty of categories out there that you can sell in as a new seller that don't require you to get ungated. So don't feel forced if you're finding that this is the niche that you're looking at and doing the research in and you're not gated in it, it may be one to put off to the side and look for something new because you might not have either the funds to invest upfront or whatnot. Finding something that is something you have access to from the get-go might be the best place to start with that first bundle and then move on from there. Once you get the handle with one, then move to the next step. Totally. Yeah. Make, make sure you can prove out the model for as low, as low risk as you can before making any, any bigger investments. That makes total sense. So what comes next? So we've got this product idea. We've kind of identified some potential suppliers for this. How many products makes a good bundle? Is it just like that shampoo and conditioner, like, hey, a two product bundle? Or is it like this 10 item variety pack? 
You'll get a variety of different answers depending on who you ask. What Kristen and I work on in our businesses is we stay between four and six items per bundle. And there's a reason for that. You can do less, you can do more. The reason we stick in a smaller range and we're not doing the 10 plus items per pack is because you're going to deal with backordered items. You're going to deal with discontinued items when you're dealing with wholesale and creating bundles. And when you don't have access to that particular product, you can't sell that bundle. So you can go from having a really lucrative, well-selling bundle that's dead in the water because one of the four products that are in it or one of the eight products that are in it is discontinued. You can get that in any bundle, but the fewer products you have in a bundle, you may have one that's out of stock for a period of time, but you're not going to have two or three that are out of stock or discontinued. Yeah, fewer moving parts because you're probably sourcing these from different suppliers. And that's and that's one of the value adds. It's like, hey, look, I'm doing a lot of the work for you. Correct. Okay. So four to six items. <laughs> that makes sense. Hey, here's my 28 item variety pack. And then as far as packaging that stuff up, so you are getting, well, now you have your prep center, but like in the early days, you're getting all these shipments to your house. You're sitting in the garage and saying, okay, I'm going to put these four items together into a pack and then I'm going to resend all that stuff into Amazon. Yes, an assembly line format, the checking in process and arranging and then using, we would do like a circular type motion. So you could think of a circular assembly line where you your incoming stuff is checked in right there because the faster you are is less touch points. The less amount of time you're touching products and moving products, the faster you become. So we've worked out over the years a, a system where bringing it in and, and sorting it and checking it in and, and doing a circular assembly line to where it's it's moving in and out with as little touch points as possible. So yes, that's the concept of you know unboxing it, reboxing or rebagging it into the bundle form and then putting the Amazon FBA labels on them and then shipping them off to Amazon is the process. Are the labels created inside your seller account? Meaning the, the FN SKU labels that we put on the product? Yeah, this is a, a portion of the process that has been confusing to me as, a, as an outsider looking in. So yes, basically what you're doing is you are putting in the product into Amazon and it will spit out an FN SKU label. This is basically the barcode that says this product is attributed to Amy's favorite things store so that when that product sells or when that product gets transferred between warehouse A and warehouse B, it tracks that all along its journey. That's how it knows where it's going. So you are, and this is one of the parts of the process is you're going to be labeling each one of those products so that when it gets to the warehouse, Amazon can scan it into their system. Okay. And that lets them know that it's from you and to give credit when it sells. Exactly. And during that process is when you're kind of creating that listing, you're creating this from scratch, not like retail arbitrage, piggybacking on a listing that already exists. It's like, okay, I've got to create my baby bottle variety pack listing. You know, here's what's inside for breastfeeding babies. And here's how it, here's how it works. Or here's my product description. Correct. It's like you're bringing a brand new product to the marketplace. So you are creating your own listing and you're creating your own photos and things like that. I mean, we get our photos mostly from our manufacturers and their stock photos and have them edited together, either Photoshop or we pay a service to do those things or a VA, but then you're creating your listing. So yeah, that's why keywords and, and phrases and things are very important to build your listing so that you can create that organic traffic for your item. The good thing about it is that it's a one and done kind of listing. If you choose to sell a product that's replenishable, you just need to create that listing just that one time, and then you can continually sell that product over and over. So you want to make it the best that you can make it in the beginning. And there's always room for improvements. You can always tweak your listing, change the wording, change the title, things like that, because you own the listing. It's up to you to be able to edit it. Yeah, it's not set in stone. It's like a blog post. You can go back and edit it if you need to. Exactly. Is there a price point that you guys, like you mentioned, hey, one of the advantages is a higher price point. So the flat fees kind of become a lower percentage of overall sales. Is there a minimum price threshold that you like? Or I'm just curious about that kind of strategy. Because as we're diving into this, hey, this is a lot of work that goes into this. So you want to make sure you've got those good margins. And it really depends on the number of items and the amount of time it takes to bundle them together, right? So if I have two small lightweight items that I can throw in a bag and send it into Amazon, there's a lot less time. Whereas if I have an eight item bundle or six item bundle, 
that requires a boxing and wrapping and bubble wrapping takes more time. I want to be able to fetch a higher dollar for that. My bottom is $19.99. I don't have a maximum, to be honest. Like, if somebody's willing to pay a higher dollar for what I'm bringing to the table, I'll put it out there for them. I think it's the same that the minimum price that we've found that's really worthy of the time and effort that we put into it is right around that $20 sales price. So that's not our cost, but that's the sales price. Because again, Amazon does charge those flat fees, but then they all have they also have a percentage based fee that's based on the sales price of your item. So that fee is variable, but there are the the flat fees or based on weight fees that the lower your price is, the lower your margin is going to be, the higher the percentage seems when it comes to the fees. So yeah, the sweet spot is is about that $20 range, but by all means, you know, you can bundle all the way up to, I think our most expensive one was $110 or something like that. So we, we range anywhere from $20 to over $100, depending on the items that, that we're acquiring. And is there a target margin within that price? Like, oh, I want to make 50% or I want to make however much? Absolutely. A lot of times you see people playing the volume game on Amazon. They're willing to take a little bit of money for selling a volume of it. We kind of flip that on its head. We don't want to make anything less than 75% ROI. 100 or more is better. And the reason being is when you're doing bundles, it takes the time, energy, and effort to put that together. And I want to be able to sell enough to to, to factor that in. And making 30% on it it's not worth it to me on that on that front. So being able to look at it from that perspective really helps. Okay, interesting. So that $20 bundle cost you theoretically $5. Pretty much. That's about that's about what we target. And the reality is a lot of people will come through and they'll look at wholesale price lists or they'll look at things like that and they'll say, "I can't make money on this." the margins are too thin. And we say, you're right, you can't because single unit items are not necessarily lucrative all by themselves. This is the reason we created wholesale bundles to begin with, because we were having a hard time, even at wholesale, looking at vendor price lists and being discouraged because we could almost get it for that price when it's on sale at the store. And so what we did was adding things together builds margin upon margin. So then now the the customer thinks they're getting more value and getting more because they're getting more items. And it just looks like a, a more value package deal when really the value is really in the package itself and the time it saves them to to purchase it all together rather than separate. We found that it was really difficult to compete with single unit items, even with wholesale prices. And so putting things together combines those margins together and makes it more worth it to you to be able to sell in variety packs or in gift sets or things like that because it just adds more margin to your pocket rather than the single unit items. That's interesting to hear because my guess would have been, okay, if I'm going to buy the five pack or the variety pack, like I would want that to be priced slightly less than buying those five items individually. But you're saying, hey, people are actually willing to pay a premium for that. Think about who the Amazon buyer is. The Amazon buyer wants what they want when they want it, and they're willing to pay more to be able to have that service. How many times have you gone on Amazon because you couldn't get what you wanted or needed something for something upcoming, and you could go to the store to buy it, but it's easier to buy it on Amazon and have it delivered directly to your door in two days or less? More times than I probably care to admit. It's more the the second one. Like I just don't want to go to the store. Exactly. And that's why there is a market on Amazon for bundles because people are willing to, you're you're taking the work out of it for them. Going back to what Kristen said before with the one-click society, people want ease. They don't want to have to do all of the work to find all those parts and pieces by themselves. They can go in and find everything you need. For example, my son just got a bearded dragon for his birthday. Instead of going and buying all of the parts and pieces, which is a lot more than I ever anticipated for our new bearded dragon, going onto Amazon and being able to buy the starter kit with all of the pieces that come with it. I don't have to do all the research. It's all there. Yes, I probably paid a premium for it, but it was worth it because I didn't have to spend the time doing the research to figure out what I needed. Okay. Yeah, that's a cool example. Thanks for sharing that one. Is there anything that you're doing to proactively market these bundles after they're live on Amazon? Or is it just a matter of waiting for those keyword searches to start generating some impressions and sales? So what we teach and what we practice is doing all of the work up front. 
we don't want to even put the work into putting a bundle on Amazon if we don't have the confidence that it's going to sell. This is not throwing spaghetti at the wall and hoping it sticks. This is doing the hard line research ahead of time, looking at the tools and software and pieces in Amazon and other places, the words that are available and the data that's available and creating a bundle based on the supply and demand that the data is telling us. So yes, we start with ideas that we think would be a good idea. And then we we actually validate and vet those ideas before we put a bundle out there. So by the time we get to a bundle that's reaching Amazon, we have the confidence that's going to sell sell through based on the data and the research that we put out there. So there isn't much need to do pay-per-click or advertising or anything like that because we're creating a bundle the customers are already telling us that they want based on their searches, based on complementary items that are out there, based on other data and numbers like from Merchant Words. We're only choosing bundles that we believe are going to sell. And it's not just what we think is cute or what we like or what could potentially be popular, but we're using data to make those decisions so that when it does get to Amazon, we're not hoping that it sells. We're confident that it's going to sell based on the data that we've looked up and put together. So doing the work up front, it sounds like is the is really the key here so that you don't have to spend on ads, which is really common in the private label space. It's like if I, I'm going to make this first big initial order and then I'm going to have to pump a bunch of paid traffic to it just to get those initial sales velocity. But you're saying, hey, if we've done the homework right, we won't need to do that. Exactly. Is going through those, like if you're on a, an individual product and you're looking at the people who bought this also bought this or frequently bought together, is that a source of bundle inspiration or is that people are just happy buying those individually? It is certainly a bundle opportunity to at least start for inspiration. That was a good word that you used to start the process because there are times when you look at that and go, well, that doesn't make sense as a bundle. I mean, I've seen toilet paper, granola bars and a plunger before. So you have to look at it and be objective with what you're seeing and doing the research. It's not just looking at that and going, I'm going to buy these three items and bundle them. It's doing the legwork that goes along with it. it is definitely a springboard for when you're starting to learn how to bundle to give yourself some ideas to research. If you're just dipping the toe in the water, would you do like a retail arbitrage bundle? Like, let me just go source a handful of these at Walmart, send them in, see if they sell. Absolutely. And sometimes we encourage people to start there, especially if you have a really low risk tolerance or you have a lower budget, or maybe it's just one of those products that has a really high wholesale minimum order, for example. And we've done many retail arbitrage bundles, and it's a good place to test the market and to start. The difficult part about that, though, is that, you know, once you do it and you get used to that, then sourcing the product going forward, you want it to sell. So once it starts selling through, the the sourcing of that product over and over in a retail space is going to be much more difficult than if you're sourcing it from wholesale where you can just send a PO and reorder anytime you'd like. Yeah. And now you're out of stock and now your listing tanks and all this stuff. Have you found that these listings sell without any reviews early on? It's just like, hey, we'll count on people taking a risk on and being that first buyer. We actually don't ask for reviews on our product. and never have and sell just fine. It, there are oftentimes we have product that hits the warehouse and sells instantly. Now I will say, I will preface I was saying that that's not all of the time, but there are, that does happen. And it's all about the searchability. It's all about knowing what they're searching for and putting the product in front of them that when that search happens, they're going to find it. And it really depends if it's, if it's an electronics item, that's a whole different scenario. It really depends on what category you're selling. And there are some categories where I would say that reviews matter a lot more than in other categories. In grocery, I'm not necessarily looking at reviews. I need almond butter. I'm going to buy almond butter, right? So really understanding the actual category that you're selling in will help you determine if reviews are necessary. But for what we've sold over the past five years, four years, it hasn't been necessary. Have there been any big bets you've placed down on inventory that have not worked out? I will I will share my flop on only because it was learning wholesale. And you will learn as you go through the process. If you're not flopping, you're not growing. And so my first wholesale purchase, if I had gone with what happened in my first wholesale purchase, I would not have an Amazon business today because I bought $500 worth of a product and I sold a total of zero. Mm, 
Ouch. And it's painful, but I learned a whole lot from that process and realizing what it was about that particular product and why it didn't sell. The particular product, nobody could tell what the heck it was or what it did. It was a great point of purchase item, but it didn't work well and come across the way it needed to online. And so understanding all of those parts and pieces. So yes, you are going to have mistakes. You're going to have things that don't work out the way you want them to. The nice part about bundling is you can repurpose. You can create new bundles. Both Chris and I have done that where this bundle didn't work out. Maybe it's that all of a sudden there's a lot more competition than there was. You can pull that back and repurpose it, create new bundles, create new products that can go in and fit a different need. Do you mind sharing what that product was for the sake of Side Hustle Show listeners so they don't make the same order? All right. So the product that was were, I don't remember what it was called. They were headphone decor. So thinking of your white wired headphones from Apple, and there were these little beads that you put on them to make them fun and funky. They were great for tweens, great for young teens, for decorating what they were all the time. The package was cool. They came with elastics you could hook to bags and all these types of different things, but you can't use a lifestyle image as your main image on Amazon. Even with keywords, it wasn't enough of a draw to be able to have people go and buy that item. It's really something that you're seeing at a Best Buy where they're buying their new phone, they've got their headphones. Oh, that's the cool either gift add-on or something that I want to buy for my headphones. It was a harder sell online. Okay, interesting. Thank you for for sharing that one. Kristen, what about you? Any flops to share? (laughs) Any inventory purchases you wish you could get back? There was a couple of mistakes, you know, we made early on. We went to a couple of discount stores you know, even when we were doing retail arbitrage and doing some bundles and had no idea that it wasn't quite an entire pallet, was almost an entire pallet of crackers that were expired and or very close to expiring. And so they didn't meet the minimum requirements of Amazon. And so the entire bundle was a bust because of this one specific and rare, hard to find variety of crackers. But unfortunately, they were all not quite close to the dates that you wanted them to be. And so that kind of made the entire, before it even hit the warehouse, it was kind of a bust. And so things like that. But again, like what to echo what Amy was saying, we have to make mistakes. And sometimes another bundle, for example, we had was meeting all of the criteria. All the keyword searches were there. All of the numbers were there. So we put this bundle together What happened was so did everyone else want to do something similar, and then it just became immediately saturated. I don't know if it was just one of those trends that kind of come and go, but we put some bundles together and literally we sold one unit out of 50. And so we brought it back and we repurposed it and ended up singling out a couple of the units. And then the other units we in the bundle, we repurposed with something else. And then those did really well. So I think the the good news about bundling is that because you're dealing with many components, you can definitely repurpose them and put them other places. It's not a total loss. Like if you buy a pallet full of specific one single unit items and then it becomes saturated and you can't make money, that's just a single unit item. But with a bundle, you have more of an opportunity to repurpose or reuse or make a different bundle from the components that you already have. I guess it's a little bit less risky in my mind because you can bring that inventory back and repurpose it as to where if a single unit item tanks, you're just kind of out of luck. Yeah, it's physical inventory. Unless it's food that is expired, you can usually at least break even on it, sell it as individual items, sell it on eBay, just get rid of it, clean it out. The rule for food is three months out for an expiration date? A hundred days. So yeah, close. What's next for you guys? What's What's got you excited these days? Where do you see this um, wholesale business going in the next year or two? I absolutely love wholesale bundles. Now, growth-wise, my goal right now has has pivoted, and it's to maintain and continue being able to do this. Now, that means that I don't just get to sit on what I'm doing right now, right? I don't get to keep the same bundles that I have for eternity. That's not how the world of anything in retail works. So my goal is to add as bundles fall off, as trends fade, but it's to maintain where I'm at. I've gotten to a point where I can work on my business for Amazon one day a week. And that's been a huge relief to me to be able to do all the other things because I'm a serial entrepreneur and I can't stop myself. So be able to focus on it one day a week. That's really my goal. That way I give the freedom and flexibility to be there for my kids and to take piano lessons, which is something I've really wanted to do and things like that so that I can have this 
segment of my life for Amazon and have it earning and generating an income that is what my family needs at this point. That's awesome. What about you, Kristen? Well, I'm, I just published my first book. So I'm really excited to, again, echo Amy in that, that we're, we, our Amazon businesses are such a well-oiled machine that we can focus on other projects and other things we're doing. Like with Mommy Income, we are teaching many workshops across the country to teach people our wholesale bundle business model. And so this frees us up to be able to travel around because we're, we've got such a well-oiled machine that we are only working on our Amazon businesses one day a week so that we can do the things we love, like piano lessons and teaching and training other people to start and grow their wholesale bundle businesses. And also just for me, it gives me the freedom to be able to, you know, I just wrote a book this in the past six months. And well, plug it, plug it. What's the title? What's the book? The book is called Dream Big, Step Small, Learning to Reduce Overwhelm by Building the Business of Your Dreams. And so that launches on June 10th, 2019. And so I'm excited to be doing some podcast interviews and just some speaking engagements around the book. And th that's the beauty of the Wholesale Bundles is it's freeing Amy and I both up to do other things that we love and to encourage other people to build similar business models so that they can have some income freedom, some location freedom of whatever they want as far as their business is concerned. Absolutely. It sounds like you guys have achieved just that. Dream big, step small. We'll link that up for you in the show notes. Check out mommyincome.com. Kristen mentioned the live in-person workshops. See if they're coming to town near you. If you hit up mommyincome.com slash roadmap, you'd be able to download their roadmap for your first wholesale bundle. Figure out how to get started in this business, diving into a little bit more what we talked about today. And then they have a Facebook group. If you're into this stuff, I encourage you to check out the Mommy Income Facebook community. The pretty link to get there, or the short link to get there is Mommy Income dot com slash join us all one word and i understand there's a secret code to get into the group what's the secret code for side hustle show listeners so your secret code for your listeners is going to be side hustle nation we just do this so that it's not just anyone joining the group we try to keep it to amazon sellers people that have specific questions we don't want spammers and things like that in there and so you're going to need a code word in order to join us so that's going to be side hustle nation are non-mommies allowed of course Absolutely. We are two moms helping people make an income online, and that's where the mommy income piece comes from. But we are equal opportunity educators. Well, very cool, guys. Really appreciate you joining me. Mommyincome.com. Again, check them out over there. Let's wrap this thing up with your number one tip for Side Hustle Nation. Let's say Amy can go first. My number one tip is the tip that actually brought me to know Kristen. And that is if there is somebody who you look up to in business who is doing what you want to do and you, you see them growing and evolving and you want to follow that same trajectory, pick up the phone, send them a message, say, can I buy you coffee? Can we have a chat? I'm interested to see how I can get to where you are. And most people like to talk about themselves. And that's what I did with Kristen early on. And it opens up a dialogue and helps you grow your business as well. It was that true, Kristen? Was that how it started? Yeah, you know, it was really, I was happy to hear from Amy and ha happy for her to reach out to me and be able to, to chat with that. And I'm just one of those people that don't allow anyone to hang out in their comfort zone. So when Amy was asking, I was challenging. And what I didn't know about her at the beginning was that she loves a challenge. And so she was just crushing any, any challenge I would throw at her. And that's how I knew that we were going to be really fast friends. And, you know, my one number one tip for anyone out there in any business whatsoever is commitment and consistency. So whatever it is that you're diving into, you don't want to be a jack of all trades necessarily. You're not going to jump in and try something for two months and decide it doesn't work. Decide and commit to be consistent. And when Amy and I decided to put content out there, it was consistently. It was like, we will do a live show once a week for at least 12 months and then reevaluate and see what's happening. So commit to your business model and be consistent no matter what, even if it's small, even if it's one hour a week that you're committing, commit to that one hour a week and be consistent. Which I think is how I first discovered you guys. Actually, I think it was an email from Merchant Words that was like, hey, check out what these people are doing with wholesale bundles. And then I click there and, you know, follow the rabbit hole. It's like, listen to a couple of your podcasts and it's like, hey, this is cool stuff. We should, we should do this on the Side Hustle Show. So putting out the content obviously gets some attention and sooner or later people 
can discover that. So very cool, guys. Appreciate you joining me and we'll catch up with you soon. All right, my top three takeaways from this call with Amy and Kristen. Number one is to start with what you know. I think this is probably the most important thing when it comes to beginning your product research process. They gave the examples of granola bars and Shopkins toys. I had to look up what those were. But Amy and Kristen started with what they already knew. I think your research is naturally going to spider out from there, but it gives you a place to start rather than loading up the Amazon homepage and just randomly clicking around. And of course, the same thing goes for service businesses and content businesses too. There's so much other stuff to learn along the way. So make life a little bit easier for yourself by at least starting with a topic or product you know something about or have some interest in. I think you can couple this episode with Chad Rubin's direct-to-consumer product research discussion from episode 336, and even from our low-content publishing discussion a couple weeks ago. The common thread was to try and uncover areas of unmet demand. What are people looking for but not finding? In the case of the bundles, what products that are already out there might make sense to put together? Where can you add value? What types of products or bundles might not be available in local stores, but people might think to try Amazon? I like this one because everyone is going to bring their own creativity and shopping experiences to the table. An example I just saw the other day was the supplement stack recommended in the 4-Hour Body. Tim Ferriss, I think, had four different supplements that he recommended, and you take them in this particular order, and you see all these weight loss benefits. Of course, these statements have not been evaluated by the FDA, right? So the seller had the idea to bundle all four of those together into a one-click package. I thought that was a pretty good idea. So that's takeaway number one. Start with what you know. Takeaway number two is it starts with one. I know this was the takeaway from our low-content publishing panel as well, but like most business models, this one is going to get easier once you go through the process. It's okay to be a newbie. I think Amy mentioned that. And that's an important reminder. Everybody starts out as a newbie. Every all-star was once a rookie. For me, back when I was doing FBA and even listing items on eBay, there was a certain level of inertia in getting started. Like, am I doing this right? How does it all work? What kind of packaging do I need? What should I price this at? All that stuff. And really, the only way to get over it, for me at least, was to just do it. To follow the advice from people who'd gone before me, sure, in terms of sourcing criteria, but then to actually go through the process of setting up the account, sending the inventory in, and then having the crazy rewarding moment of checking the app and seeing like $150 in sales. Wait, like it really worked. But you can't make any sales until you put something up for sale. So that's takeaway number two. It starts with one. And takeaway number three is don't expect sales to last forever. As the market moves, you've got to move too to find new products and bundle opportunities. And this is probably true for every business. And I think the bundle model might have a little bit longer lifespan than other Amazon-centric models just because of the potential complexity in sourcing and being more difficult to piggyback on listings. But it's similar to what Chad told us a few weeks ago. You can't stand still. The good news is, once you figured out how it all works, you should be able to use the same process over and over again, even as the products change. And while that might seem depressing, I think it's exciting, especially for new people coming in, because there are always new niches and opportunities opening up. And that goes for physical products, digital products, services, and pretty much everything else. I mean, every week in my inbox and in the Side Hustle Nation Facebook group, I'm seeing new ideas I never thought of before. We are endlessly creative, and I believe the best fuel for that creativity is to take those first steps. Once again, be sure to hit up sidehustlenation.com slash bundle for links to all the resources mentioned and to download the free PDF highlight reel summary with all of Amy and Kristen's top wholesale bundle tips from the call. That's it for me. Thank you so much for tuning in. Until next time, let's go out there and make something happen, and I'll catch you in the next edition of the Side Hustle Show. Hustle on.